Good morning and welcome to our first service on Sunday morning. We have two services. The first is devoted to Bible prophecy, where we do our weekly prophecy updates. And second service, which will be live streamed at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time, is our verse by verse study through the Word of God. And today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3. And Lord willing, I'm going to ask and answer the question of, are our Christian lives really all about Jesus? Kind of a convicting title. So if you're not here second service, we'll know. <laughs> also, for those that are watching by way of YouTube or Facebook, uh, we'd really encourage you to go directly to jdfarag.org. There you can watch the update in its uncensored entirety without having to transition there after the introduction. I hope that uh, those of you that do will be patient with us. We're still trying to work through some technical difficulties, and we very much encourage you to pray for us in that regard. So last week there were some significant prophetic developments in the Middle East, as I'm sure many of you heard, specifically in and with Israel. Yamina leader Naftali Bennett, Lapid and Ra'am chairman Mansour Abbas, signed an agreement at a meeting on Wednesday night in the first coalition deal ever signed by an Arab party. This is unprecedented, for lack of a better word. Also, many are keeping a close eye on Russia and their military exercises in international waters just 13 nautical miles off the island of Kauai, here in Hawaii. Did you hear about this? Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> According to this popular mechanics report on Wednesday, two U.S. air defense missiles failed to intercept a simulated ballistic missile. This is Russia, right off Hawaii. The Russians had likely been tipped off to the test by notices of air and sea closures designed to protect civilians from military activity. Certainly they are flexing their muscles, and they have muscles to flex, by the way. Suffice it to say, Things are revving up geopolitically in their significance prophetically as more and more pieces of the prophecy puzzle are put in place. However, after praying and fasting concerning what the Lord would have me to talk about for today's update, He impressed upon my heart to start with His Word to Jeremiah the prophet. Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah said, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out His hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. In verse 17, the Lord's word to Jeremiah is, Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, Whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. It's for this reason 
that I, by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, will fearlessly address the most important issue that is facing every single one of us today, namely that of the very real and present fear of the unknown. This because there's just so much we don't know. We don't know about what's really going on, so much so that even many of the experts are left searching for answers themselves. This has given way to much in the way of speculation concerning that which lies ahead in the coming days, weeks, and months. Thankfully, when we don't know, we can go to the one who not only does know, but has also told us in advance so we can know. One of the things that I'm learning is that God does not want us ignorant concerning Bible prophecy. God does not want us ignorant concerning the last days. However, there's a prerequisite, and I'll explain what I mean by that. This requires us to believe by faith in the Word of God and the promises of God, having confidence in what we hope for, which is the evidence of that which is yet unseen. Therein lies the problem. The problem is, our human nature says, Seeing is believing. I want to see it, to believe it. That's not what faith says. Faith says, believing is seeing. If I believe, then I will see. This is what Jesus said to Martha when He raised her brother Lazarus from the dead in John 11:40, He says to her, and never imagine that there's a, a curtness in His voice or a harsh tone. I imagine the Savior always having a gentle, compassionate, kind and loving tone when He says this to her. He says, did I not tell you? that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. When the Apostle Paul writes of the Corinthians in his second epistle, chapter 5, verse 7, he very clearly says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Sight is the antithesis of faith right? If I see it, ah, there's no need for faith, because I already see it. No, if I don't see it, then that requires, that's the prerequisite, it requires faith. What's faith? Well, the writer of Hebrews defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence, strong word, the evidence of that which is yet unseen. That's what faith is. Faith has evidence. It's not a blind faith. It's an intelligent faith. And it's a faith in the one who says, trust me, believe me, if you will but believe, you will see. But our problem is, like that man who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Oh, that's honest. 
And I think that's the heart cry of every single one of us here today, isn't it? You know, we don't have a word for unfaith. We don't call it unfaith. We call it unbelief. What's unbelief? It means to be without belief. I know this is a... <laughs> it sure sounded better when I wrote it out, but <laughs> you get the point, right? You'll forgive the illustration, but for lack of a better one, and by the way, if you have a better one, please let me know. But when the soda manufacturer wanted to come up with 7-Up, they had to come up with a campaign, an advertising marketing strategy, because they were going up against Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola, who had the lion's share of the market. So brilliantly they came up with this marketing campaign. 7-Up, the Uncola. Oh, wait, Uncola? Yeah, no cola in it. It's the Uncola. All of a sudden I'm looking at Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola out of the corner of my eye, because now this is the Uncola. It contains no cola. Again, if you have a better illustration, I am absolutely open. But when you say unbelief, what you're saying is there's no belief in you. Unbelief void of belief. You have no belief. As I was preparing for today's teaching in Hebrews chapter 3, which by the way I'm really looking forward to, what a fascinating chapter. I was struck by the writer's reference to the Israelites' unbelief. And what was so striking about this particular reference is that it's the account of when the Israelites had arrived at this place called Kadesh Barnea, right there on the, just on the cusp of the Promised Land. Sadly, even after seeing the Promised Land for themselves, 10 out of the 12 of the leaders of the tribes still didn't believe. And you know what happened? It cost over 600,000 men their lives, not counting their wives. Here's the account. It's in Numbers 32. I'll begin reading in verse 8. This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land. After they went up to the valley of Eshkol and viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. The Lord's anger was aroused that day, and He swore this oath, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Not one of those who were 20 years old or more, when they came up out of Egypt, will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, not one except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun. And here's why. For they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. The reason I wanted to begin this way is because there are some similarities between the Israelites then 
and where we are now. First, it's believed that the Israelites were about two years into the wilderness wandering when they had arrived at this place of testing. And by the way, the 12 that were sent out to spy out the land did so for 40 days, 40, the number of testing and judgment. And it was for that reason that for every day in their unbelief, they would spend one year wandering in the desert and would not enter in to the promised land that God had given them. So too, are we heading into year two since this crisis began? And we are now arriving at our own Kadesh Barnea, where our faith is being tested. Another similarity is that the Israelites were fearful of the unknown. Yeah, I know God promised us this land, but not so fast. What's there? <laughs> Shouldn't we go check it out first? You know, but God said it's the land flowing with milk and honey. He already gave it to us. Let's just do it. Let's just take God at His word. You, you, wait, you don't believe God? You have to go see for yourself? Yeah. This is why Moses caved under the pressure and sent out the twelve to spy out the land in the first place. Uh, I want to say it's about Deuteronomy chapter one-ish, heavy on the ish. <laughs> Uh, we kind of get some of the blanks filled in as to why it is that Moses did this. God had already given them the land. They were, all they had to do was just take it. Were there battles? Absolutely. But this was the land that God promised them. But they succumbed to fear. And Moses succumbed to the pressure to cave into this fear of the unknown. And in so doing, they found themselves riddled with unbelief. Like with the Israelites then, so too is this true now, by virtue of how many are listening to the fear of the ten, and not the faith of the two. So they spy out the land, 40 days go by, they come back and they report back to Moses. And not only did all of the Israelites listen to the fear of the ten, they believed them. They believed the ten instead of believing the Lord. So we're told, Numbers 13, verse 27, then they told him, speaking of Moses, and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Imagine them pointing to these huge grapes so huge that it took two men to carry them back to the camp of the Israelites. You know what they're saying here? They're saying, you know, it's true. It's exactly as God said it was. God promised us that it would be like this, and it's true. God's promises are true. You know what's coming, right? It's what I call an eraser word. But 
nevertheless. In other words, everything that we just said here to for means nothing now because of what we're going to say now. Yes, it's exactly as God promised. It's exactly as God said. It's exactly as God gave us His Word it would be. But this is where we have to be very careful about where we put our butt. And I don't mean that that way. (laughs) Would to God they would have said, Man, there's some big giants in that land, but God's promises are true. That's the but in the right spot. And let me just take that one step further, bring it a little bit closer to home by way of personal application. I know God promises to provide my every need, but The rent's due, and I don't have it. Your butt is in the wrong spot. You'll forgive me again for saying it like that, but I think you get the point, right? Here's what you should say instead. You know, the rent's due, and I don't have it. But (laughs) God promises that no matter what, He will always provide. Well, we've got a but here. It's in the form of, as some of your translations render it, nevertheless. The people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb, verse 30, quieted the people before Moses. Oh, I would have loved to have been a fly on a camel to see this. This is Caleb we're talking about. Mighty man, stop talking. Shut your mouth. Be silent. Do not speak anymore. He said this, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the man who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel, listen, a bad report, a wrong report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anna came from the giants. And We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Hmm. Let me see if I've got this straight. Um, There's some big giants in there. Yeah. Is it your God bigger? And and, and by the way, I just have one more question, not of you, I'm asking them. Uh, 
Are you calling God a liar? Because see, God promised you this land, that He was going to give you this land, and that you would take this land, take possession of this land, and that you would overcome whoever or whatever is in this land that I promised you. So you're saying that God's not being truthful? Hmm. When you get to Numbers 14, beginning in verse 36, we have God's response to this. We're told, now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought, listen to this, the evil report. So first it's the bad report, now it's an evil report about the land. Listen to this, died. How? by the plague before the Lord. Well, that's interesting. Actually, um, it's kind of ironic too, because their fear overtook them and caused them to falsely accuse God of wanting to kill them. In fact, if you're interested, you can go to Numbers 13 and Numbers 14 and read the account. It's, it's chilling. I'll just warn you in advance. It was so bad that they actually wanted to elect a president. You'll forgive me for using that uh, phraseology <laughs> to take them back to Egypt. What? Because they, in their unbelief, believed that they would die if they were to take possession of this land. Isn't that ironic? And they even complained and murmured about, what about our children? Our, ch our children are going to die. And God says, well, actually, you know what? Your children aren't going to die. You are. Anyone under the age of 20 is going to go into the promised land. But this generation will not. And then verse 38, we're told, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. This brings me to the aforementioned addressing of this fear of the unknown, which I'd like to expound on for the remainder of our time together today. But in order to do that, we'll end the live stream on both YouTube and Facebook at this time and redirect you to the website if you're not already there. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that we're all prone to fear the unknown, especially in a day when and at a time when there are so many unknowns. One of the biggest unknowns is why some who've taken the jab get very sick, or worse yet, die, while others have had no reactions at all. Another big unknown is this matter of transmission, 
from those who have taken the jab to those close in proximity who refuse to. This is a big issue and a big unknown. Yet another very big unknown is the long-term adverse effects of those who have been given the jab. Actually, this is probably as good of a time as any to mention to those of you who attend or plan to attend this church locally, if you are in any way uncomfortable or concerned, given all these unknowns, we will absolutely understand if you just want to watch on online. Please know that we in no way wish to look down on anyone for doing that. And if you deem it necessary to err on the side of an abundance of caution, we absolutely understand that. Now I realize this can see, seem cliché, but the fact is that we don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. And God, who holds the future, has told us in His Word what the future holds at the time of the end vis-a-vis -vis Bible prophecy. I want to take it a step further and suggest that this fear of the unknown can actually be a good thing, because it can be the very thing that brings people to the Lord, as I believe it is even now doing. These unknowns are seemingly getting worse with each passing day, and perhaps that's what it's going to take. And by that I mean, as more and more people know about the adverse effects from the jab, it can have the much needed effect of leading more and more people to know about Jesus. Again, as I believe with all my heart, it is even now doing. One need look no further than to just the headlines to realize that there are serious adverse effects from this so-called vaccine, which is not a vaccine, it is an operating system. If this weren't bad enough, said headlines also point to this massive push to jab everyone, young and old alike. What follows are just 25 such headlines from just the last couple of weeks. And I want to read them, and I'll do so quickly. But if this trend continues, then this is only the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Number one, OSHA says employers who mandate the COVID vaccine won't have to report its adverse effects. Two, OSHA backtracks won't hold employers requiring COVID shot liable for workers' vaccine injuries. Three, no parental consent needed for COVID-19 vaccine, says Philly Health Department. I want to come back to that one. Number four, Moderna warns New waves of COVID-19 are coming. Moderna, mod if I, RNA, Moderna. That's what the name means. Five, CDC looks into a possible connection between the COVID-19 vaccine and a heart problem in young people. Six, EU regulator green lights Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. Seven, 
employers can require COVID-19 vaccine under federal law, new guidance states. Eight, BC doctors stripped of ER shifts after raising COVID vaccine side effect concerns. Nine, you might have heard about this one. BBC presenter Lisa Shaw died after suffering blood clots following COVID jab, say family. 10. It was devastating. Oregon woman reports multiple blood clots after Johnson and Johnson shot. 11. Israel to rule on adolescent vaccinations linked to heart inflammation next week. Adolescents, 12. Over 10,000 Americans got COVID-19 despite being fully vaccinated, CDC says. And actual count could be way higher 13. Anti-vaccine conspiracy theorists <laughs> are blaming vaccinated people for shedding virus in their presence. Hmm. 14. Belgium halts J&J &J COVID vaccine for under 41s after one dies. 15. To beat side effects, Israel considers giving teens just one COVID vaccine dose. 16. Dr. Zelenko calls child vaccine mandate coercive human experimentation crimes against humanity. 17. This is interesting. Here is why hashtag arrest Bill Gates is trending in India. We've talked about this. Again, these are just the headlines. Oh my goodness. You know, I actually started out thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote some of these uh, reports. And then I thought, by the time I'm done, we will, well, the rapture will happen before I get through all of them. So <laughs> these are all headlines. 18. Despite vaccines, nursing homes struggle with outbreaks. <laughs> 19. Israel reports link between Pfizer's second shot and heart problems in males under 30. 20. Some countries with the highest vaccination rates are facing a surge in COVID deaths and infections the highest vaccination rates. 21. Concerns rise over Chinese vaccine adverse effects. 22. Post vaccination hearing loss reported in China. 23. Thousands under lockdown amid reports of adverse vaccine reactions in China. 24. Some 2,000 people had severe adverse reactions to Pfizer-Moderna vaccine. 25. Israeli study shows a majority of those vaccinated can be infected by SARS-CoV-2 after the first shot. 25. You'll forgive me for drawing this comparison. 
But to me, those who are sounding this alarm about what's really going on, they are the Joshua's and Caleb's of today. Conversely, those with the bad, evil, wrong report are like the ten leaders who spread the virus of fear throughout the entire camp of the Israelites. You know what's interesting? I was thinking about this. You got these 12 leaders of these 12 tribes of Israel. They spent 40 days in the land. They all saw the same exact thing, all 12 of them. But out of the 12, there were only two. Talk about a minority, Joshua and Caleb, who despite what they saw, believed. And they took a stand, and they took God at His word. But here's the thing. You want to talk about going against the crowd? You know, at first it's two against ten. But it wouldn't be long before it became two against over 600,000. You do the math. They were the only two. Every single one of them. I mean, it spread. That's what fear does. So all they had to hear was this report from the 10, and it spread. Hey, do you hear, do you hear what they, they said about the land? No, yeah, no way, way. We better take the jab. Can you connect those dots? Why? Well, I, I don't, I don't want to die. So <laughs> that's what fear does, doesn't it? Where are the Joshua's and the Caleb's? who believe and have the faith unflinching in their fearlessness. This is what I mean by the prophet Jeremiah. I find it very interesting that God would say to him, you, you do not be afraid of them. You do not be in fear of them. You're going to tell them what I'm going to put in your mouth, the words to speak to them. And it's not going to be what they want to hear. But you're going to speak it anyway. And don't be afraid about what they say when you do. Because if you fear man, then I will make you fear them, and that's the trap. No, you fear me, the fear of the Lord. To fear man is a trap. And this is what I mean by fearlessly addressing this evil vaccination push and going against the crowd. I've lost a lot of friends. Of course, that presupposes I had friends to begin with, but I do still have some friends. You like me still, right? <laughs> Just say you do. Humor me. 
You know, oftentimes I, <laughs> I think it would just be so much easier were I to just go along, to get along, and, but I cannot. I fear the Lord, man. I don't fear man, man. <laughs> I think of the Apostle Paul. He, he was a humble man, you know, and he humbled himself and he asked for prayer. And he was very specific when he asked for prayer. He asked for prayer for boldness. And this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about. You, Paul, boldness? Are you kidding me? Yeah. And I would covet your prayers for boldness and continued fearlessness. I have to say that, and this is not hyperbole, it's it seems that with each passing day it's getting infinitely more difficult. It's just last Tuesday at our prayer meeting. Did you hear about this? I heard about this Tuesday night at our prayer meeting. It's this COVID-19 Vax Squad bus here on Oahu. You know what they're doing? Oh, you didn't hear? They're jabbing children without parental consent. As you might imagine, this has infuriated many parents, and rightfully so. So much so, a parental watchdog group submitted a notice of liability letter from the Council for Restorative Justice explaining that they violated a plethora of ethics codes for failing to adequately provide informed consent. So after the prayer meeting Tuesday night, um, I went home and cried. <laughs> and I told my wife about this and she started, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, she got so upset. So she started doing some research on it. And um, actually before this all happened, our daughter was going to be required to take uh, of a shot for, I hope I get this right, HPV virus. Okay, I'm right? Yeah. You know what that is? That is a sexually transmitted disease. She was 12. And I'll tell you, my wife, what a woman. <laughs> it's my girl. She's like, no. Nah. Ain't going to happen. That was then. This is now. And they're doing this without parental consent. Why? Does that not strike you as odd? Hmm. Why the push? What's the rush? And young people? I, can you, do you know of even one young person that died of COVID-19? I don't. Hmm. I will not keep my mouth shut. I cannot. This is evil. This is pure evil. If you'll kindly allow me to, I want to pose two questions that I think all of us would do well to consider. 
Here's the first question. If you are put in a position where you're faced with the no jab, no job, or no jab, no entry threat, are you going to believe God's promise to provide, or are you going to cave into fear? Question number two. If you have taken the jab, Are you now going to trust the Lord, regardless of whether or not you've had any adverse effects or not? Here's the bottom line. We are all now at our own Kadesh Barnea, and we're going to have to make a decision as to who it is that we're going to listen to. Fear or faith? Our faith is even now being tested like never before. Do you know what that means? That means that we must now trust the Lord like never before, like never before. I don't care how big those numbers are in the land. They keep putting those numbers on the television screen. Turn it off! Did you notice the shift? I just, I'm digressing here, just indulge me. Did you notice the shift when this thing first started? The number of cases, 200,000, 300,000, deaths, 600,000. And the vaccine comes out. Uh, Let's give credit to where credit is due. And by the way, I don't fear man when I say this, but it was Donald J. Trump who started this vaccine. Operation Warp Speed. And as soon as the vaccine came out, hmm, there was a shift. I'm not looking at the numbers of the cases anymore. I'm looking at the numbers of the vaccinated now. Hmm, that's the Anakim. Those are the giants, because that's the fear. That's the ten. That's not the two. That's not the Caleb and the Joshua. That's called faith. Faith comes how? By hearing the Word of God the promises of God. Do you know how many promises there are in God's Word? And that's what God's Word is, God's Word. (laughs) I know that's deeply profound. (laughs) God has given you His Word. You know, if I say to you, I'll give you my Word. I promise you, I'll give you my Word. This is what God says, "I, I give you my Word. I cannot go back on my Word. I have promised you this. God cannot break a promise. You know how many promises are in here? You know, these updates have been getting harder and harder. (laughs) Some of you are looking at me like, hard for you? How about us? (laughs) This is really hard on us. I know. I make no apologies. You know, I think about the disciples. It was actually Peter who said to Jesus, actually Jesus asked the disciples, because all the multitudes had started bailing after a hard teaching. 
And Jesus looks at the disciples and says, are you guys going to bail on me too? And Peter's response is, which tells me he thought about it. Because he says, where else are we going to go? Oh, you, you thought about where else could you go? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. You alone have the word of truth, the word of life, the bread of life. I'm going to continue doing these prophecy updates every week for as long as the Lord gives me breath. And I'm going to continue every week ending with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to end every week with a simple childlike explanation of salvation with the ABCs of salvation. What's the gospel? It's the good news that Jesus Christ was crucified and buried and rose again on the third day, and He's coming back again one day to take us out of this Christ-rejecting evil world, to take us to the place He promised us. By the way, please, the promised land is not synonymous with heaven. The promised land, is, and we're going to see this in Hebrews 3, is synonymous with all of the promises that are ours for the taking, if we would but believe. But that was His promise. I promise you, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, mansions, those beach estates that they're building over here on Kailua Beach. <laughs> yeah, not even a toilet. I don't think there's going to be toilets in heaven, but <laughs> reminds me of that one pastor who said, you know, it's like the guy who wants to take his gold to heaven, and he shows up and God looks at him and goes, What's that? Oh, it's gold. To which the Lord responds, why are you bringing asphalt? The streets are gold here. What are you doing? <laughs> Just to put it into perspective. But that was His promise. I promise you, and if it were not so, I would not have told you. I would not have made this promise to you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you will be also. It's the bridal chamber that He's preparing for us. He's going to snatch us away as His bride, as a thief in the night, and take us to this place that He's prepared for us. That's the good news, the gospel. The ABCs are, again, just a simple childlike explanation of salvation. The A is for admit or acknowledge that you've sinned. You're a sinner. It's when we acknowledge that we're a sinner that we acknowledge our need for the Savior. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all transgressed. We've all missed the mark. Now there's a penalty, and this is the bad news. And the bad news in Romans 6.23 is that the wages of sin is death. We all have been sentenced to death because all have sinned. We were all born sinners, which is why we must be born again, Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the bad news, the death penalty. Here's the good news. Somebody will go to your death in your place. His name, Jesus. And He will pay in full your debt, your sin debt. 
He will go to the cross in your place, and His blood will be shed in your stead. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And so He dies for us instead of us, and then gives to us a gift He paid for. And that gift is the gift of God, and it's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The B is simply for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised Him from the dead. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And the C, lastly, is for call upon the name of the Lord, or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And Romans 10, 13, lastly, says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that simple. I want to share with you something very exciting. My dear friends Jim and Chris Cote of the Master's Touch have a new ABCs of Salvation mailer that you can have mailed to love, loved ones at no cost, no cost to you. So if you select the ABCs at the top of the menu bar and the Send Postcard tab, it will take you to this 5 by 7 postcard that will be mailed to up to five people. And by the way, some of you are looking at this card going, is this anonymously? Yes. <laughs> Good, because on the front it says, the most important decision of your life, showing somebody refusing vaccination, then on the back it will say, is eternal life. And it's as simple as ABC. And then it has the ABCs of salvation. And for those that want to follow up, they are directed to the website. If you want to take advantage of this, we would certainly encourage you to do so. If you scroll down, you can enter up to five names and addresses that you want this sent to. This is in the U.S. We don't have the international ability to do this yet. We have had many people in other parts of the world ask for these postcards that they them, themselves will send out and mail out. Last time we did this, we were in the tens of thousands that were mailed out. The ones we know of that were sent back, it, they would say something like this. Um, I went out to the mail and I got this postcard that you sent me. They think, they think I sent it. <laughs> I'll be the bad guy, right? And I recommitted my life to Jesus Christ. I went out to the mail and I, I got your postcard. And the Lord had really been speaking to my heart. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ because of it. And those are just the ones we know. We have no idea. Why don't you stand? We'll have the worship team come up. And I'll just end this way, I guess. Um, If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, believing in your heart, putting your trust in Him for the forgiveness of sin, I don't know what else to say. Today 
is the day of salvation. Do not put off or delay even a moment longer the most important decision of your life for eternal life. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and I'm going to keep telling you, Jesus is coming for us any time now. I'm going to keep saying that every week. There will be one week where I will not say it, because <laughs> I won't be here, and you better not be here either. <laughs> he is coming. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for anyone maybe watching online that has heard you speak very clearly into their lives. And this is very real. Lord, I pray that today they would surrender to you, call upon you, believe in you. Lord, I thank you for the gift of eternal life. I thank you for Bible prophecy, for telling us in your word, promising us in your word, and informing us about what the world is going to look like at the time of the end, before you return. Because in so doing now, we're we're looking at what's happening in the world, and it is exactly as you said it would be. Lord, I thank you that there's still time, though very short, to get as many people to you and you to as many people as we possibly can. Lord, thank you. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for dying for our sins. And Lord, come quickly. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, Amen.